Welcome back to Carnades.org. Today we're going to be continuing with our series, Dumbfounding Definitions, Dizzying Distinctions, and Diabolical Doctrines, a series sorting through some of the jargon of philosophy. In this video, we're going to be continuing the mini-series, What is Nationalism? Looking at what is civic nationalism. Now, in this series, we're looking at three positions on nationalism. These each take positions on two central questions, what responsibility and rights we have with respect to our nation, and whether nations should have a right to self-determination. Civic nationalism claims that individuals do have rights and responsibilities to their own nation, but they are not entitled to their own countries because of it. So this is a rejection of the idea of a nation state that we saw in communitarian nationalism. But also, it does claim that there is some relationship and you do have some special responsibilities towards your nation as a, a member of that nation. So let's look. Civic nationalism, also known as liberal nationalism or multicultural nationalism, attempts to take a middle road in between communitarianism and cosmopolitanism. It advocates for pluralistic countries with many nations. These countries are bound together by a commitment to liberal values of democracy and human rights to prevent tyranny of the minority or the majority. But each nation is given the right and responsibility to uphold their own cultural traditions. So to be clear on that kind of tyranny of the minority and the majority, the idea here is that democracy, so the ability of the majority to elect leaders, will prevent a tyranny of the minority. So minority nations or minority groups being able to hold power because the majority will be able to elect leaders who are reflective of their populations. However, this also requires the commitment to human rights that are often enshrined in a constitution, and if you have a strong judiciary, that judiciary is able to defend those constitutional rights, which protect the rights of the minority communities against the majority, because the constitutions are usually difficult to change, and hopefully the judiciary is, at least to a certain degree, above political influence, and therefore above the will of the majority to overrule the civil rights of the minorities. That's the, the framework and the idea behind how civic nationalism can work and how it can allow both majority populations to maintain a certain set of rights as well as minority populations to maintain a set of rights and have neither be oppressed by the other. Whether it works in practice is a question for the political scientist, but that's the philosophy behind it. Now, this view avoids the challenges of communitarianism by requiring a liberal civic government structure, allowing for multinational countries and preventing some of the ideas and challenges we saw related to war with communitarian nationalism. Because in theory, under this philosophy, all the countries are basing their ideology not on some national, cultural, ethnic dogma, but rather on commonly shared ideas of pluralism and democracy and human rights that can hold multinational countries together. People are bound together by shared civic identity within a country, into that country, and that civic identity, not their kind of nationalistic culture, is what holds them together. And that civic identity is often closely aligned with ideas of human rights and democracy, the, the, the central pillars of a country. And the country may, to a certain degree, form its own national ideology there, though that depends from country to country. It avoids the challenges of separating ethnic communities into different countries or forcing someone to choose only one nation. If you're living in a pluralistic country, you can be part of one national community on one side of your family and a different national community on the other side of your family or on a different day of the week. Objection. So civic nationalism, because it's kind of a middle road alternative, it faces objections coming from both sides. The communitarian nationalist claims that civic ideas are not strong enough to bind people together and that these societies will necessarily fall apart and devolve into nationalistic or tribalistic infighting as opposed to the concern for the communitarian that they will devolve into outfighting outwardly between nations. A country bound together only by civic nationalism cannot remain cohesive and will fall apart, if you believe the communitarian. 
The cosmopolitan, on the other hand, will raise the concern that cultural and ethnic bonds divide people. And even if they are not imposed by a government, they allow people to ignore their responsibilities to all humanity. By forcing people into certain ethnic groups based on their traditional culture and saying you have to uphold the ideas of your family or your heritage, you have a problem with people that want to step out of that culture or say, eh, I don't like this culture, I'm going to go a different direction or not support this culture because I think that there's some ethical problem with this culture because I don't identify with it closely because I think its values are wrong. You have this problem of if you have a responsibility to uphold your heritage, then what happens to the people that think their heritage is wrong? And even worse, what happens when a culture has bad values that broadly are globally considered to be immoral? While the civic nationalist has dealt with some of the concerns around, well, how we can have those cultures interact with each other and have that shared framework of democracy or human rights, it doesn't deal with the kind of universalist ideas of maybe some cultures are just wrong and people that are in those cultures may want to get out of them, whether that's a religion or a particular ideology of oppression that you think is bad. The civic nationalist might respond that a country which works to sufficiently integrate nations will gain a strong enough bond to create a cohesive country. They might claim that countries like the United States have successfully integrated immigrant populations into a national civic identity, not necessarily a nationalistic, whether that's cultural or ethnic identity. Even if some countries in Europe have more segmented societies where immigrants are less integrated into national identity. They might argue that preserving national identity and culture is an important good in itself in face of the cosmopolitan arguments. They might say that the loss of, say, a language that's only spoken by a few people is a loss to the world. And if you're one of those people that speaks that language, you have a responsibility to preserve that language, even if you would be helped in your economic prospects by learning a language that is more commonly used or teaching that more commonly used language to your children. You have a responsibility to preserve that language because that language or that cultural identity is a good in itself. And losing a language or losing a culture is a loss to the world, even if it puts a burden on you as a member of that minority culture, that almost extinct culture, to continue it or to preserve it. However, one might be concerned that even if nations living in America have been integrated and are not in danger of falling apart, America has struggled to live up to its commitments of civil liberties to minority nations. For the communitarian, this is evidence that nations cannot exist justly in the same country. For the civic nationalist, the best way to protect all nations is to unite them under states which have a real commitment to liberal democracy. The communitarian doubts that this is possible. On the cosmopolitanist side, the cosmopolitanist may say that forcing someone who is probably already in a fairly oppressed situation because they are one of the last people of their ethnicity to maintain their culture and their language, which may isolate and further push them into desolation, is really problematic. And people matter more than cultures, and they would rather a language be lost than an individual or a culture be oppressed for not being able to or allowed to join in the cultures of other nations or participate in those cultures or give up on parts of their culture that they think are problematic. What do you think? Can a country bind together many nations under civic responsibilities? Or are such projects doomed to failure, either through collapse or subversion of those civic responsibilities to the nations in power? What about the cosmopolitan's argument? Do you think that a dying language or culture is valuable and is sufficiently valuable that we should say that members of that culture have a responsibility to preserve it, even at the expense of their own livelihoods? Leave your answers in the comments below. That's not, and, and it's not to say the cosmopolitan is not saying that the individuals of that culture don't have the 
right and ability to preserve that if they want to. Rather, the cosmopolitan is saying they should not have a responsibility. They shouldn't be forced to preserve their culture or forced to continue the culture of their fathers or their mothers simply because they're the last of that culture, or simply because that's the culture they were born into. You can, you can preserve the culture if you want. That's not what the cosmopolitan is saying. The cosmopolitan is very specifically saying you should not be forced to preserve that culture simply because that's the culture you were born into, which is something the civic nationalist is advocating for. Leave your thoughts in the comments below. Watch this video and more here at currentaties.org and stay skeptical, everybody.